You guys have no idea how nervous, nervous this makes me. I mean, here I sit in a room of men who know the scriptures and who, without question, uh, have you know a, hot, a, a whole lot more legacy and experience than I do. And it is humbling to me to be able to preach the truth, whatever the truth is, whether it's eschatology or eschatology or soteriology or pneumatology, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, it's humbling to uh, have that task set before me. So I intend to do the very best that I can to present a lot of information to you here this morning. A lot of information that honestly is just, we're just barely going to scratch the surface of this. It's, this is just the hem of the garment. But it's good information, so I'm going to ask that you try to hang in there with this. I have, I think, 34 slides, and each slide rep represents 30 minutes of talking points. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. so, so just hang in there with this. Uh, but it's going to turn out good, I'm sure, uh, not because it's mine, but because it belongs to the Lord, and this is uh, what the Scriptures teach. So I think one of the biggest problems in the churches of Christ, let alone in, in uh, Christendom in general, is a, is a gross misunderstanding of Hades and what Hades is. So what I think we need to do is, the very first thing we need to do in traditional Church of Christ style is to define things. So I'm going to give you the traditional definition. So if I were to ask a Bible class, and I've done this many times over the past uh, however many years I've... Uh, so 17 and 54. How many years is that? So anyway, um, 30 some, 27, 30, 37. Well, that's a lot of time. But so anyway, uh, the point here is I have over the years learned that when I ask a question then in, at the beginning of a class, I always get the same answers. And, and so whenever you ask about what Hades is, and they, everyone answers it in, uh, especially these guys on Facebook today, and they say it's the realm of the unseen, or the unseen realm of the dead. There you go. So that's pretty much a standard answer, but it's a whole lot more than that. You know, people think that Hades is something that it's really not, and certainly not based on the scriptures. So here's what I need to do. I need to show you some things outside of the scriptures. Because I think when you see some of these things, you're going to see why we have morphed into the belief system that we have today when it comes to Hades. And then specifically, I want to kind of address this idea of death in Hades. Because I see something there that maybe some people don't, but I'm just going to show you what I see and you do with it what you will. And we're going to try to address also this idea of death being destroyed in 70. We, you know, we, we really get uh, a lot of criticism and people say to us, well, you know, then why are people still dying? If Jesus has already come, why are people still dying? Because you don't understand what death is. So if you start off wrong from the beginning, you, in the end, you're just way off. So those are a few things that we're going to talk about. I'll try to use this PowerPoint and uh, read you this, these things. And uh, so if I have to turn my back to the camera, I apologize about that. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to start out talking about the Egyptian concept of hell. Now right here, from the very onset is a problem, and I hope you see it in the very first line of this, and it's this term hell. Because they didn't call it hell. It wasn't their concept, or rather their concept was not ours. So we'll, I'll show you this in just a moment. But it would be more the afterlife, but I had to put hell up there because that's the way people view Hades. And, and I can tell you how many people who say, well, Hades is hell. It's, it's really not. So let me read this. Let me show you what these guys did. And you're going to see some similarities between even some things in the scriptures, what the Jews believed and what people believe today. So the Egyptian concept is that, uh, uh, and this is from, uh, I love this. I found an article online by a guy named John Watson. It's not me. <laughs> but but uh, on ToreEgypt.net. So in the ancient Egyptian religion it is very similar to those of our modern religions. Those who were judged unfavorably faced a very similar fate to our modern conception of hell. And perhaps even more specifically to the more middle-aged concept of it as a specific region beneath the earth. For the damned, the entire uncontrollable rage of the deity was directed against those who were condemned through their evils. They were tortured in every imaginable way and destroyed, thus being consigned to non-existence. 
They were deprived of their sense organs, were required to walk on their hand or their heads and eat their own excrement. They were burned in ovens and cauldrons and were forced to swim in their own blood, which Sesmu, the god of the wine press, squeezed out of them. Boy, that's <laughs> that's a great view. I mean, yeah, I'm I, I'm so thankful for Yahweh <laughs> because this is uh, this is horrible. And people live under the same misconceptions about Hades today. So anyway, let's, let's look at the next slide here. Oh, I wanted to illustrate here what's going on here. And you'll see this. They're weighing the heart of this individual against the feather of, uh, I don't remember the name of the god, to see if it passes the muster or not. And if it's a good heart and it uh, stacks up, then they get to proceed on to the next level. Osiris. Was it Osiris? Okay. That might even be one of these. I don't remember what all this is. But anyway, so here's the next slide. And you can see here, this is very interesting. The weighing of the heart from the Book of the Dead of Ani. Uh, at left, you, hear, uh, you have uh, Ani and his wife, Tutu, enter the assemblage of gods. Well, this gets interesting. So at the center, you've got Anubis, Anubis, and he weighs Ani's heart against the feather of Mat. And at the right, the monster Amut who will devour Ani's soul if he's unworthy. So this is this half-leopard, crocodile, hippo, I think, guy. And he awaits as he awaits the verdict, while the god uh, Thoth prepares, I think that's how you say it, prepares to record it. So on top you have these gods acting as judges. So when you died, you have these different gods up here. I think I counted 12 of them, by the way. I don't know if that's significant. You plug it in. Uh, and you had to go through these different judges here before you got to, you know, the end of the process. So here in this uh, cup, you can see Hermes, um, psycho, ho, ho, whatever, <laughs> it's like Hermes Psycho, there you go, sitting on a rock and he's the God who's preparing to lead a dead soul to the underworld. Um, so that was found, I think, or, or, or comes from around 450 B.C. So this information is pertinent to Old Testament times and, and their understanding of things. And I think they really intermingled a lot of their understanding from being uh, in Egyptian captivity, which is one of the reasons I wanted to talk about that. This one is, is uh, Greek, the Greek concept. So let me go through this uh, rather quickly. So in mythology, the Greek underworld is a distinct realm, one of three realms that makes up the cosmos. Enoch said there's four. Where an individual goes after death. The earliest idea of afterlife in, in Greek myth is that at the moment of death, an individual's essence is separated from the corpse and is transported to the underworld. In early mythology, like in the Iliad or the Odyssey, the dead were indiscriminately grouped together and, and led a shadowy post-existence. They kind of continued their life. On the other side. However, in later mythology, uh, like with Plato, elements of post-mortem judgment began to emerge with the good and the bad people being separated, both spatially and with regards to treatment. The underworld itself, commonly referred to as Hades, after its patron god, also named after its patron god, but also known by various uh, uh, metonyms, is described as being located in the periphery of the earth. Either associated with the outer limits of the ocean or beneath the earth, darkness and lack of sunlight are common features associated with this underworld. And in this way, provide a direct contrast to both the normality of the land of the living, where the sun shines, and also where the brightness associated with the Mount Olympus or the realm of the gods. The underworld is also considered to be an invisible realm which is understood both in relation to the permanent state of darkness but also potential etymological link with Hades as the unseen place. The underworld is made solely for the dead and so mortals do not enter it. With only a few heroic exceptions who took, uh, you know, like uh, Heracles, Theseus, Orpheus and possibly Odysseus and later Roman depictions, Aeneas. And if you remember who Phil was, that's a lot of yuses. Very few people are going to get that movie reference. You've got to have kids in, their, in your 20s and 30s. Okay, so, but did you see this? What's the standard definition when you ask people what Hades is? Oh, it's, it's the place, the unseen realm of the dead. I, it, this is my contention. That today, people are just as Hellenized from the Jewish standpoint and corrupted in their thinking as they were 2,000, 2,500 years ago. And that was a real problem because 
They weren't seeing things the way the scriptures point this out. And you'll see this as we, as we go along. Now think about this. They're just as Hellenized or have this uh, skewed perception. Yeah, yeah. Of, of, um, of uh, eschatology. Because everyone else believes that, well, Jesus is coming in the future. When everybody in the scriptures and most of the people that have anything that know anything about uh, the scriptures, outside of the scriptures, the ancient ones, taught that Jesus would come in what we refer to as the first century. Now think about this. And I'll say this real quick and then we'll move on to the next slide. Enoch, I, I'm not saying that Enoch, I'll, I'll make reference to Enoch several times. I'm not saying Enoch is inspired. Enoch was inspired. The book of Enoch uh, has some inspiration in it without question. I don't know if the whole thing's inspired, but it's not canonical. It's not something that I'm going to refer to and we say, oh, okay, we've got to follow this. But there's a lot of good information there. When we look at the pseudepigrapha and we look at those intertestamental writings, we can see how these people thought. And whoever wrote Enoch a couple hundred years before Jesus came believed that in a couple hundred years... From his standpoint, and from Enoch's standpoint, seventy gener- I think it's 70 generations later, that Jesus would come. That puts it squarely in the first century. Hmm. Somebody understood eschatology more than people do today in, in these uh, ancient people. Let's look at the next one. So this is the Greek concept of Hades. They, Hades was called Pluto and different things. And Persephone here, they are enthroned in Hades in this underworld of Greek mythology. So this is 18th century engraving depicting the other world of Greek mythology. Showing in the foreground, Sharon, the ferryman, and his boat, uh, Cerberus, on the, and the three-headed dog guarding the entrance of Hades, the ruler of the underworld, and his wife, Persephone, the body of waters, the river Styx. And these are all familiar concepts. But, think about this. The familiar, or the, per, uh, the popular concept today is, is when you die, guess what? St. Peter's there to meet you. At the gates. You see how all this stuff gets mingled in here. Or you've got these, uh, whatever, these uh, demons or bad angels, whoever, you know, whatever the popular belief is at the time, are there to wait to take you to hell. And they're not going to let you out. You see, it comes, a lot of this comes from, from this Greek and misunderstanding. Here's another one. Um, this is kind of pictures of... of uh, the ancient conception of what they look like. So Hades and Persephone are in the underworld. And they're just reclining. Having a good old time. No big deal. No. So that's the uh, Greek concept. Let's talk about some of the ancient Jewish concepts of uh, Sheol and Hades. Now, one of the things I have to make a point here is. Most people don't understand that Sheol and Hades are the same thing. It's just one is Hebrew. Sheol. Uh, or Sheol. I'm, okay, I'm a Hoosier. I don't know. I, I, I'm confused. I don't know if I say creek or crick or roof or roof. So I, if I say Sheol and it should be Sheol, there you go. So now you know why. But that's Hebrew. And Hades is Greek. Okay, so the, they're the same thing as far as Scripture goes. But in the, So this is from uh, Jewish Encyclopedia. It says, uh, The question arises whether the biblical concept is borrowed from the Assyrians or an independent development from elements common to both and found in many primitive religions. Though most of the passages in which mention is made of Sheol, it is synonymous... Uh, I lost my place. Uh, oh, its synonyms are, uh, are of exilic or post-exilic times. Uh, the latter view, according to which the biblical concept of Sheol represents an independent evolution, is more, the more probable. It reverts to primitive animistic con- uh, conceits. With the body and the grave... Remains connected to the soul, um, as in dreams, or the dead buried in, in family graves continue to have communion. Um, you see there from Jeremiah also, and uh, says Sheol is uh, practically a family grave on a large scale. Graves were protected by gates and bolts, therefore, Sheol was likewise similarly guarded. We're going to talk about this gate idea in a minute. The separate compartments are devised for the separate clans, sects, and families, national and blood distinctions continuing in effect after death. So that Sheol is described as subterranean is but an application of the custom of hewing out the rocks, passages, leading downward for burial purposes. So now you know why they 
cut holes and dug uh, sepulchers inside of a rock, or dug uh, graves there inside of a rock, or inside of the mountain, um, because their perception was that when you die, you go to Sheol, and that's under the earth, as this illustrates. You can find this online anywhere. This is millions and millions of uh, images out there. But So let's talk about this. This is the ancient Jewish concept of Sheol or Hades. So in Genesis, um, it uses the word for uh, firmament is beaten out bowl. So they would view this as, and I'm not here to discuss black. Okay. So you, you talk to me afterwards if you want to, but, but I'm, not here, I'm not here to talk about that. Um, just saying. So there's a, there's a firmament over it. There's this bowl over, over the earth. And uh, the earth is flat. And then Sheol is under the ground. Then you've got the abyss underneath Sheol and so forth. So this will be pertinent as we go along. So we need to put this in our mind. And of course this is the American concept of Hades. <laughs> so only a few people know that. And they muted me on uh, one particular flat uh, platform. So uh, I'm learning. You can't even say these words anymore. So we'll see what happens here. Okay. Now, let's talk about what Hades is not. Hades is not hell. Now, I found this one a little difficult to make a um, slide for. So I just put Gehenna definition here. So let's talk about Gehenna for just a minute. Hades is the place... Where you go when you die. Not today, because Hades has been destroyed. We'll talk about that in depth as, as we go along. But Hades was destroyed at the, at the victory of Jesus. That's the victory of Christ, guys. Okay, so there's that victory. But it's not hell. Our perception of hell is too close to Egyptian or Greek or even some of the uh, ancient uh, uh, Jewish guys. So, Gehenna is the term that is often translated to hell, even in the, I use the New American Standard, 1995 edition, <laughs> um, for a while and more anyway. So, But, um, of course, I look at everything, you know, it's, it's kind of the way it works. The Bible helps great for that. But Gehenna is not Hades. Because people think that when you die, you go to hell. Um, isn't this, Okay, here's something that... I'm just going to point a little inconsistency out here to you. How much time? When did I even start? About a quarter after? So I'm thinking. People are okay with when you die, you go to hell. I can't tell you how many, how many people. If you're a bad person, you die, you go to hell. But if you're a Christian, you die, you go to Hades. Wait a minute. Does anybody else see a problem with that? Because I do. Go ahead now. Okay, so you've got, let's break this down. So you've got Gi, which is earth, right? And Henna. What is that? Well, depends who you talk to because nobody really knows. Is it the, the sons of uh, Hinnom in the valley, or it was named the uh, Valley of Hinnom? It kind of morphs into uh, this trash dump, which you cannot prove, outside of Jerusalem. I mean, some people talk about it, and I don't have a problem with that. That's what it was. Um, that's constantly burning. Um, the fact of the matter is, we don't exactly know. Now, I'm sure Holger could get up here and preach for an hour on Gehenna. I know he could, because I've heard him do it. <laughs> um, and he makes some great points. But when you boil it all down, for our purposes, Hades is not hell. Hell is a modern misconception. Hades is a biblical concept. Hades is not hell. If you look at Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus said, I say unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Now that makes that powerful. And it proves that Jesus returned in the first century. And here's the reason it proves that. Because when the church is built, and which it was in the process of being built for 40 years, between the cross and the destruction of the temple, when it was finished, Hades was destroyed. And that's exactly the teaching of Revelation. It teaches it seven times over. Amen. Okay? Now, if you put the gates of hell will not overpower it, you put in an unbiblical concept and you come out with an unbiblical understanding. 
And that changes everything. Hades is not the lake of fire. Let's talk about this. Okay. So Matthew chapter 18, verses 8 and 9. It says, If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into eternal, the eternal fire. Hmm. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than have two hands, or uh, sorry, two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell or the fiery Gehenna. Now, what is he talking about? He's talking about the lake of fire. Now, if you look at uh, Mark's account in chapter 9, he says that this is the unquenchable fire. Now, the lake of fire is eternal. Well, from this standpoint anyway, it goes on and on and on. It never ends. This is the way I see it. I'm a, if I'm wrong about it, show me. But it never ends. It's the fire that is unquenchable. Un, un, unquenchable. And then, for example, how would you have, if Hades and the lake of fire are the same thing, how would you have Hades being thrown into Hades and destroyed it's just a question I'm asking, and I think I got the answer. Because they're not the same thing. Uh, let's go to the next thing here. Hades is not Tartarus. Now, this is going to be an interesting one, so just bear with me on this. Tartarus, so they used one time, 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4, but we'll talk about that in a moment. But Tartarus is a Greek conception. That's right. In Greek mythology, Tartarus was both a primordial, primordial deity... That existed before the Olympians, as well as a name to describe a region of the underworld. Huh. Spelling error for all you, for Roy, sorry. Okay, so 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into, this is not hell. You see, do you see why we're so confused on what Hades and hell and Tartarus and, all, and Lake of Fire? Why we're so confused on this is because we have these translations. And all my quotes, by the way, are from New American Standard, 1995. Uh, and so it causes us, well, for example, like the translators in Daniel 12 use the term end of time, not time of the end. It's two different things. And they have their own agenda and their own beliefs. Now, why do they have their own agenda, their own beliefs? It's because oftentimes it's the way that they were born. It's the way that they associated. It was their family belief. It's an ancient belief that goes back so many generations, whatever the case is. And it carries through their education. Now, let me say this. Just because a man has a doctorate in theology doesn't mean he's right. Right? Right? I can name at least one person <laughs> uh, who's got a doctorate, or is working on it anyway, I think, and he's as wrong as you can get. And he still refuses to see that. But yet you can have a man who studies the scriptures and digs and can still see these things because he does it. <laughs> yes. yes, I heard it. <laughs> um, yeah, right, yeah. I think I picked it up, Roy. <laughs> yeah. So, um, let's see. Let's see, I lost my place there. So, uh, anyway, so, um, because we're told to study and be diligent about these things. And that's a difficult thing to do. Most people do not do diligent Bible study. You, you're lucky to get them to diligently come for an hour one time on Sunday. And that's not good. You know, we're supposed to study. Even modern so-called Jews, by in name only, look at Christians and they say, What is wrong with you people? You say you love the Lord, but you don't study. They study all the time. They're so uh, preoccupied with it that they'll write down little passages and put it in a little box and strap it to their head. You know, <laughs> I'm not saying you have to go that far, but or maybe under their arm or something like that if they want to be discreet. But this is not hell. Second Peter 2, 4, it's Tartarus. He said... God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into Tartarus. Where does this come from? Let's continue to look at this. Huh. This is the abyss here. Under Sheol. It's not... Sheol is the place where humans would go. But other beings... Here's my thought on this. And let me finish this. Other beings have the same choice that you and I have. If God created angels, did they have choice? Did they have to stay there? Were they bound there? 
I don't think that they were. It's just like men. Now some would say, and I know this is controversial, that after you die, get ready for all the comments, just get to see my Facebook page. After you die, you still have choice. Hmm. You just chew on that for a while. What gives glory to God? A robot? Or someone who has choice? So anyway, this is their concept. So this abyss here would be Tartarus. Now look what Enoch says. I told you I'd refer to him. In Enoch, 1 Enoch 19, matter of fact, Enoch talks a whole lot about uh, Hades. Sheol, Sheol. Here shall stand the angels, have connected themselves with women and are defiling mankind, and shall lead them astray into sacrificing to demons as gods, and they shall stand till the day of the great judgment. Wait a minute. Didn't the demons say to Jesus, have you come to torment us before the time? wonder where that came from. What did Enoch say? At least 200 years. Now, maybe, maybe the pigs uh, uh, could talk. I mean, I'm sorry. Um, maybe this man was just crazy. Have you come to torment us before the time? Maybe he was just out of his mind. I'm not here to debate that, but I'm here to make this point that somebody believed this before you and I were ever around. And before Jesus was around. Okay, so they've been teaching this. And Peter wrote about it. That carries a tremendous amount of weight with me. So let's, we've looked at what um, a lot of the popular beliefs are. So now let's look at the scripture. What does the Tanakh say? So I referred to the Tanakh because that's, I don't know, I just, I could call it the Old Testament, but somehow it doesn't seem like it's doing it justice to me. Um, and it's a little more than the Old Covenant. So Tanakh, Tanakh fits. That's what they called it, so we're going to use that. But basically the Old Testament. So, but what does it say? So I'm going to show you, I'm going to paint you the picture of what the Bible paints, this beautiful mosaic that comes out to give us a clear picture of what Hades or Sheol is. Okay. Now, we're going to, or I'm going to ask you as we go through this, in your mind, all this stuff that we looked at, the Egyptians and the Greeks and the ancient uh, Hebrews, the ancient Jews, uh, even the American view, I guess you can <laughs> plug that in there. And listen to what this has to say, what the scriptures have to say. Now, there are so many passages about Hades or Sheol that we're just not even going to touch. Read Job. Job talks about it constantly. Well, I mean, not constantly, but it's, it's, a, it's a major theme going through there. Well, let's show you a couple passages here from Joel. Hades, if you do not understand Hades, let me just say this, you will not understand 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It's impossible. You will completely and totally mess that up. Especially if you don't understand death and Hades. So let's get into this. and Maybe start plugging some of these concepts in. So here are some terms that are used in the Old Testament. Um, I'm not going to read all these, and I can't quote all these. I'm just going to refer you to these. And, and you're certainly welcome to take a picture of this if you want a copy of this PowerPoint. Uh, I'll do my best to figure out how to copy and get it to you. Um, so you've got these terms used for Hades in the Old Testament is Sheol, which we've already mentioned. Death, which has a significance to me. It just stands out to me. So we're going to talk a lot about that. This is called the pit. It's called destruction. And it's called uh, flame or fire. You see that even in the Song of Solomon. It's talking about Hades and Sheol. So this is a popular concept throughout the Old Testament. And it has many, many different terms. So as you're studying and you're doing your yearly reading through, um, through the Scriptures, you'll start seeing some of these concepts here. So in Genesis, this is the first place, as, as to the best of my knowledge, this is the first place Sheol appears. Really, I see it in Genesis 1, starting at the beginning, uh, essentially, but um, that's just... Um, I'm looking forward to the Genesis 1 thing <laughs> later on. So anyway, so uh, in Genesis chapter 37, so Jacob tears off his clothes and he puts on sackcloth for undergarment over his waist and he mourns... For for his son for many days because he thought uh, Joseph was dead. That all of his sons and all of his daughters got up to comfort him, but he refused to, to be comforted. And here's what he says. Surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning 
for my son. Did Jacob believe you would be conscious in Sheol? Ask yourself that question. He said, I'm going to go down there mourning. Under the earth. They believed that, you know, Sheol's under the earth. I think I put... No, I did it. Um, wait a minute. Why is that going the wrong way? Because I'm pressing the wrong button, that's why. Ha <laughs> ha. Isn't that funny how that works? Um, okay, now we can go. So it's under the earth. So under the earth, they believed, and remember I showed you that, uh, that drawing, somebody's conception of it. Uh, look at Isaiah 7 to verse 11. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol, or high as heaven. So God says, Go ahead and ask for a sign. Make it as deep as Sheol, or as high as heaven. See the imagery there? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, see, I told you I'm not good at this PowerPoint stuff. Isaiah 57, verse 9. You have journeyed to the, uh, to the king with oil and increased your perfumes. You have sent your envoys a great distance and made them go down to Sheol. So you can see how they felt and why they would say that Sheol is under the earth. Let's see this more as we, we go through this. Sheol was the point farthest from Yahweh. In Amos chapter 9, and verse 2. Though they dig into Sheol, from there my hand will take them. And though they ascend to heaven, from there I'll bring them down. So the idea here is that this place, this unseen realm of the dead, is the farthest point from God. Now that's significant. If that's exactly what this means, and I think it does, that's huge. Because Isaiah chapter 59 verses 1 and 2 says, Your sins, now listen to this, Your sins have separated between you and your God. How are you separated? Sin separates us from God. And another guy online, he shall remain nameless. I'm trying to be fair. I am. And he says, well, God is in Hades. Jesus is, is, is His presence is there. Listen to this. Jesus was separated from God when He died. Now, whether you're going to take Don's view, and I see a lot of merit there, um, or you're going to take the other view that says, well, the separation was... When uh, uh, he was in Hades for three days, Peter, Peter said he was separated. He went to uh, Hades and preached. Uh, what is that? First Peter 3, starting in verse 19, I think. Maybe it's 18. But, so Peter says, that's where he went. Hades is separation. It was the farthest point from Yahweh. That's significant to me, and I think that, that's powerful. Hades swallows the living. Now this one's very interesting. Because the Greek... No, no, no. Uh, the Egyptian concept was that uh, the living couldn't go there. Well, actually, the Greeks too. The living couldn't go there. But in the Tanakh, look what number 16, you know, the rebellion of Korah. But if the Lord brings about an entirely new thing and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them with everything that is theirs and they descend alive in the shield, then you will know that these men have been disrespectful to the Lord. I don't think this is literal. They went there... Physically, bodily. But that's the language that he's using. Because here's what happens. And as he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them, their households and all the people who belonged to court. I don't think they, they slid down, you know, this is not a spiritual game of chutes and ladders, right? They, they didn't slide down the, the chute into Hades, um, you know, but I think the ground probably opened up, swallowed them up, Maybe this is a miracle. Maybe it's just the fact that they were died and died and buried. Maybe God struck them dead. I don't know. You know, there's symbology and uh, suggestion and all this other stuff. But whatever happened, the imagery is that the ground opened them up. I like that, by the way. The ground opened them up and swallowed them up, and they died, and then they went to the same place that everybody had to go. Let me point something out real quick. Romans chapter five and what verse fourteen? I think it's verse fourteen. Death reigned from Adam until Moses. In the beginning, if Romans, if, if Paul's going to uh, preach it to the Romans, and he says from the beginning, death reigned, it's not physical death. We're going to I'm gonna talk to you about this in a minute. If you start in the wrong spot, you're going to end up way over, over yonder, right? That's the way it works. So anyway, swallow the living. 
Another aspect uh, in the Tanakh is that it has gates. This is specific. Job chapter 38, verse 17 says, Have the gates of death. I love, I love Job 38. So God, say, God says to Job, He says, Job, gird your loins. You know what that means. All right, Job, put on your big boy pants. We're going to have a conversation. And he says, Have you considered? So have the gates of death. There it is, death. What's he talking about? Is he talking about physical death? It's spiritual death. The gates of death have been revealed to you. It's a spiritual concept. Have, have, uh, have the gates of death been revealed to you? And have you seen the gates of the deep darkness? I meant to highlight deep darkness. So you've got this deep darkness and death synonymous. A little bit of parallelism going on right there, right? Isaiah 38 verse 10, I said, In the middle of my life, I am uh, to enter the gates of Sheol. I've been deprived of the rest of my years. So Isaiah says, I'm going to be cut down in the middle of my life, and then I have to go to Sheol. I'm going to be deprived of the rest of my years. So it has gates. Now listen to this, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 17. Plug this in, guys. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man, and I placed his right hand on, uh, on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one, and I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. What was Jesus unlocked? What, what keys did Jesus give to Peter? Plug this in. Do you, you, you see the illustrations there? So think like a first century Jew. If you had all this background information, right? How would you have thought about it when you heard, especially all the studying that you're supposed to do, you go to synagogue, right? You sit at the feet of Gamaliel. And you read and you study this. And your father talks with you in the way every day. When you're going to the corner market, he's talking to you about God and his scriptures and the truth. So in the first century, when they mentioned something about having gates, I don't think it's a stretch to say what they could have and probably did think about. Especially when it comes to eternal life and the afterlife. These concepts are going to come to their mind. So what were the keys that he had? Because there was a gate that had a key and it was locked. You could get in, but you couldn't get out. Right? So the inhabitants, this, I found this one interesting, rejoice at the defeat of their enemies in Hades. Sheol. Sheol below Isaiah 40, 14, 9 and 10. Sheol below is excited about you, to meet you when you come. It kind of gives a, a personage, Right? Sheol is excited to meet you. It stirs the spirits of the dead for you and all the leaders of the earth. It rises, erases all the kings of the nations from their thrones. They will respond and say to you, even you have become weak as we. You have become like us. So the people who are in Hades, Sheol, Sheol, when one of these kings gets there, of course it's all over with now, but when one of the kings that Cause them lots of problems in their life. They're going, yes, see, you're no different than us. We told you so. So when Lazarus, I know, I know, I know, I know. About. <laughs> so but just let me say this, okay? Just, uh, so when Lazarus says, or, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Abraham says, Lazarus, when he was alive, had his good things, and you, when you were alive, or had his bad things, and he lived a rough life. And you, when you were alive, you nameless one, you, you had your good things. But now, now, yeah, that makes sense. Now think about this. Plug that in to Revelation chapter 6 and the souls under the altar. And they're saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, when you, will you avenge? When are they going to be down here? When is all of this going to take place? And the Lord comforts them. So maybe he was there. <laughs> anyway, the Lord comforts them, comforts them and he says, just a little while. Now, Revelation 6 illustrates the fact that Hades' days was numbered. It's just a little while. Just another internal proof. Okay, uh, where am I at here? Next. Uh, one man said, I'm looking forward to going to Hades. By the way, he said that after, in a debate, I made the point that you never hear anybody... By the way, when's the last time you sat in a congregation of people singing praises to the Lord, and you sang a song extolling the beauty of Hades. Never. 
No, it's, amen. I'll say it. Amen. That never happens. Hades was a dreary, dark, awful, terrible place. It was not a place that they wanted to be. The Jewish concept, the Hebrew concept, it's a, even a better term, the Hebrew concept was reunion with God, restoration of all things. That was no longer being separated. No longer having to endure the death. Oh, I didn't read that. I, I want to read this. So Job chapter Job says, before I, before I go, and I shall not return. But before I go to the land of darkness and deep shadow, the land of utter gloom like darkness itself, of deep shadow without order, and it shines like darkness. Boy, that sounds like a great vacation spot, right? No! Hades is not the goal. And why on earth our brethren today are saying that it is, or they, they even allude to that, just blows my mind. I can't understand that. And I'll be honest with you. This is something that I never really understood. All those years, and here I was standing in the pulpit, and I was preaching for years and years, and, and I'm telling people, oh, when you die, you go to Hades, and quote, quoting Luke 16, and so forth. It never made a lot of sense to me. Now it makes sense! Because I see the truth and I'm not caught in all this years and years and years of this historical mumbo jumbo that didn't make sense. It's also referred to as a dust pit. Think about it. Plug it in. Where do you go when you die? What did God say? God said, um, I made you. And when you die, what do you do? You turn back to dust. Now it makes sense, right? But it's referred to as a dust pit. What profit is there in my blood? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it declare your faithfulness? He's talking about Hades is the pit. It's a dust pit. Hmm. Interesting, huh? It is to me anyway. Now, 2 Samuel 12, 23 says, But now he has died. Why should I fast? Uh, this is talking about uh, David and the death of his illegitimate son. Not the best even. Now he has died. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. What do you think David understood about Sheol? When he died, where would he go? Romans 5. Death reigned from Adam until Moses. So you're going to tell me, when Moses came on, if, if the popular conception of death is a physical nature, then that means... That uh, when Moses came, if you're going to take it literal, then death ended. I don't know what that means. At the end of the law, from the beginning with Adam to the end of the covenant with Moses, death reigned. But once the covenant ended, what is the assumption of the passage? Death no longer reigns. That's the victory in Jesus. And you can't tell me that eschatology and, and understanding preterism and all things being fulfilled is not a victorious belief. It is the ultimate victorious belief. Amen. We don't have this dreariness and, and, and going to this place that you're not expected to return from. Guys, we live in the fulfillment of the victory of Jesus. This is exciting stuff. And when you go out and you preach and you teach and you talk to your friends and your neighbors, don't beat them up on their uh, misunderstandings. Because I think for, in, in, by and large, most people who are Christians, they want to serve the Lord. They don't really know what it's all about. They really don't. They've got paganism mixed in and the ancient Greek gods and uh, Egyptian religion and, and the false narrative of the Jews and so forth. They've got all this stuff mixed in. Their head is so clouded with misunderstandings that it's difficult to get through that. I was one of them for many years. And I am so thankful that I'm almost out of time. Which <laughs> one? <laughs> okay, so I think I can wrap this up and still... Uh, and still do it justice. If you start off wrong, by the time you get to where you need to be, you're going to be off by a mile. Jeff, if you start off wrong from California, and then you got mud slides and all this other stuff you got to deal with, it makes it a little harder to get to your destination, doesn't it? You've got to continue to make course corrections. 
And that's all learning about the scriptures is. You're going to continue to make these course corrections. But you have to be willing to make the course corrections. You have to be willing to, willing to say, listen, if you start off wrong about understanding death, you're going to be off by a mile when you get to all the other topics and all the other things. So let's talk about this for the next 40, what, i got, still got 40 minutes? <laughs> So here's some things I do want you to open your Bible. I want you to look at this because I have no idea how to make uh, some uh, slides for this. Uh, we don't have to go to Job because that's we already read that. Um, he just talks about, he just illustrates death and Hades is together. But I do want you to see Habakkuk chapter 2. Now this, wow, I mean, I mean this, is, this is just, this is awesome. Look at this. Habakkuk 2 verse 5. No, 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 let me read verse 4. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. I've seen several of those. But the righteous will live by his faith. Furthermore, wine betrays the haughty man so that he does not stay at home. He enlarges his appetite. Okay, so this this, uh, haughty man, this proud man, has an appetite like what? Sheol. Insatiable. Why do these people... Out east, right? East, yeah. Why do they want more and more and more? Why do you need to own all of the farmland in the world? Hmm. Why is it that the rich man wants more and more and more because he has an insatiable appetite and that is compared? And everybody knows that. If you have ever struggled in life and you have been oppressed by these guys so that they can take what little you have so they can increase theirs, then you understand what Sheol was. And like his death, never satisfied. He also gathers to himself all nations and collects himself to all peoples. That's Romans 5. That's the same concept. Death reigned from Adam till Moses. Everybody was consigned to go there until the victory of Jesus. This is pertinent uh, Hosea chapter 13 and verse 14. Which is quoted in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, of course, I have some ref- references to that um, that I would talk about. We'll just make that for another lecture, but I, I do want to mention this. Shall I redeem them from the grave? Right? Look at this. Matter of fact, matter of fact let me show you. Let, uh, let me read it here. From the New American Standard. Shall I redeem them from the power of Sheol? Shall I redeem them from death? Death and, and Sheol and Hades are... Equated. O oh, death, where is your thorns? O oh, Sheol, where is your sting? Now, when we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, notice this. Check this out. So, uh, the reason I want you to turn there, if you've got a pen, write these notes down. You know, put this next there because you need to equate these things. So, when he says, he quotes Hosea, and he says, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. It's the same concept as Romans 5. Death reigned from Adam until Moses. We've got to connect these dots. This is just how I connect it anyway. Um, Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 8 I think is extremely telling. So let's look at this. Because Isaiah 25, if you haven't noticed this, puts a time stamp on when death will be destroyed. And what does this say? It's not physical. It can't be physical death. It's impossible. By the way, the destruction of Hades is the evidence of salvation. You think about that. Isaiah chapter 25, um, verse 8. He swallowed up death for all time. And the Lord God wipes away tears from all the faces. You don't have to be sad anymore. You're not going to cry these tears. You're not going to mourn as national Israel did for the coming of Messiah to redeem them and restore all things. We don't do that. O daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, Jesus said. Where do you think that came from? Now think about this. 
If you look at Isaiah chapter 24 and 25 and you look at the context, this is at the time when the city is destroyed. Verse 2 of chapter 25, For you have made a city into a heap, a fortified city into a ruin, a place of strangers is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Jesus says this in Matthew 24 and 21. It's never going to be rebuilt. And at that time, death is destroyed. And our brethren have no clue about 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 10. Because they're trying to plug in some kind of physical death. Maybe it's a spiritual thing. Oh, I don't know. We can know because the scriptures illustrate to us that this death has been abolished. Now, let's go up here and let's uh, illustrate this briefly. I've got a good three or four topics I could speak on and preach on for an hour or two. Um, so, get over it. He says, but now, listen to this, now has been revealed by the appearing, of, not in 2022 when all the signs of the apocalypse are coming. <laughs> okay? Now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ who abolished death. He brought into existence something. Said it was already into existence. That wasn't even into existence yet. But I want to show you this nuance. He abolished death. It's as good as done. Right? And he brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So when he abolished death, was it completed? Not yet. This death couldn't be completely and totally abolished until the atonement was made. The atonement is not made until the last feast of the festival calendar. So the atonement is not made until the seventh trumpet sounds, like he, uh, Holger was talking about. When that final trumpet sounds, the atonement is made and salvation comes. That is the coming of the Lord. That's when the high priest descends from heaven, the earthly representation of heaven, and what does he do? He pronounces the atonement has been accepted. The blood sacrifice has been accepted. And now your sins are forgiven. When is this supposed to take place? We read Isaiah 25. We've looked at all these other verses. Consider this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is the epitome of abolishing death. If you look at all of the uh, present indicative active Tenses that are used in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And he's talking about this resurrection is underway. It's underway. It's, it's, it's in process. We haven't reached the end of the goal yet. The telos. But it's underway. That's the process. And it's as good as done. Is there anything, any height or depth or anything created or not created that could have stopped that? No, because that is the victory of Jesus and it occurred 2,000 years ago and we are living in the wake of it today. We have the benefits of salvation today. That's the reason Paul could preach in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because that is the power of spiritual salvation. I'm not preaching once saved, always saved. I'm telling you, the power of the blood of Jesus to prevent you from being lost. If you are His, you will not be lost. Gone are the days when I answered my Baptist friends, if you die right now, would you go to heaven? And I, my answer was, well, I'm working on it. No, sir, buddy. I'm telling you right now that if I died right now, I am saved because I'm in Jesus Christ. That's what this is all about. Every last thing that the scripture teaches, no matter what the subject, is about you being saved. And that restoration of that uh, original relationship. Okay, give me just a couple minutes. Um, so Revelation 1.18, we looked at that. Jesus had the keys to death and Hades, right? What about Revelation chapter 20 and verse 13? What, is, what does he say there? He says, it's been unlocked. Let me show you this. I love this. This is just, this is just, this is great stuff. All right? It's been unlocked. It's been emptied out. And verse, um, look at verse 10. 
Revelation 20. Can we leave this up? So the devil is thrown into the lake, this deceiver, the Satan, was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone. Okay, that's significant. We need that. Fire and brimstone. Then we see in verse 13, Well, twelve saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds, and the sea gave up the dead. That's what you were preaching on that day, Holger. You were preaching on the sea from Isaiah 60. 60. That's what it was. Um, and the sea gave up the dead which were in them, or which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and according, uh, uh, according to their deeds, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. Well, that's pretty significant if you ask me, because when does this occur? This occurs after, look at the next chapter. This occurs after the new Jerusalem comes down and the bride is adorned and the wedding takes place and all of the tears have been washed, wiped away. Now notice in verse 8. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. They're not going to Hades after salvation is accomplished for those who want to be in Christ. Where are they thrown? Not Hades, the lake of fire. The place of fire and brimstone. Brimstone. Okay. We're almost there, I promise. Guys. Seal up the scroll, Daniel was told. Till the time of the end. Seal it up. And Jesus says... Unseal the scroll because this is the time. The scroll has been unsealed. And this information is for us. Yet today. And for the last 2,000 years, knowledge has increased. And anyone who refuses to accept the truth, ah, that's not a good place to be. There are people who have obstinate hearts and say, no, 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 this, this, that, this can't be right. You were talking to somebody recently that said, yeah, I think you've been deceived. Did I catch that right? Exactly. Yeah. You've been deceived. Who's been deceived? Jesus said, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see me coming in my kingdom. Well, it wasn't being literal about seeing him. Well, they don't want it to be literal there, but they sure want it to be literal that every eye saw him. See the inconsistency? The scroll has been unsealed. Victory belongs to those immersed in Christ both physically and spiritually, and that is now. Let me talk about something. Because in the churches of Christ, we have this fantastic tradition that teaches that you have to be baptized. And most Church of Christ preachers can quote it, every verse in the Bible, just one right after the other. Start with Matthew and go, go all the way through. I'm not saying that you shouldn't. But I am saying that if we're not teaching that you are spiritually immersed in Christ, we've missed half of it. If no, actually, you missed all of it, actually. You have to be spiritually immersed in Christ. You have to give yourself to Him heart, body, and soul. That's what being a Christian is about. And that's what this all things fulfilled proves. I can go to the Scriptures. I can do the exact same thing thing today that Paul did in the first century. And when I talk to someone, I can go to the prophecies and I can say, here's what the prophecy says and here's its fulfillment. And I can have the exact same treatment that Paul got in the first century, right? (laughs) He got a lot of bad treatment. But there were some who loved him so much because they brought the truth to him that they stood on the uh, shores and they wept because he, he said, I'll never see you again. That's the kind of fellowship that we enjoy amongst us. That's the kind of love that I have seen from brethren among this group of believers that I have never experienced in my life. I've, I've known some good people that were there. They just didn't understand eschatology, but by and large, I have to say, wow, to the power of the gospel. Amen. One more click. I think. Yeah. Guys, the waiting has been over for 2,000 years. All we're doing now is, is we're... If you, if, if, if you are in Christ, we're looking back and we're figuring these things out and we're being released from the bondage of tradition and error and we're seeing the truth. 
And that has cost a lot of men their lives and their livelihoods. Being a Christian is not easy. But being a Christian is worth it every second of it. That's it.